On March 19, 2002, Progress M17, which had been docked with the International Space Station for three and a half months, undocked from the aft port of the Svesta to make way for Progress M18. It was deorbited on the next day and burnt up in the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean. Progress M18 was launched by a Soyuz U carrier rocket from Bangor Cosmodrome on the 21st of March 2002. The spacecraft docked with the aft port on the Svesta on the 24th of March. Progress M18 carried supplies to the International Space Station, including food, water, and oxygen for the crew, and equipment for conducting scientific research. After a hydrogen leak scrubbed a launch attempt on April 4, 2002, Space Shuttle Atlantis finally launched on April 8, 2002, from Launch Complex 39B for mission STS-110. The countdown on April 11 encountered an unscheduled hold at the T-minus 5 minute mark due to a data dropouts in a backup launch processing system. The launch processing system team reloaded the required data and the countdown resumed. Liftoff occurred with 11 seconds remaining in the launch window. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, we have a go for main engine start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have boosted the mission and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis setting in place the keystone to the space station's backbone. Atlantis roll program. Roger rolled, Atlantis. Houston's now controlling Atlantis, rolling on course toward the International Space Station. STS-110 was the first shuttle mission to feature the upgraded Block Atlantis II main engines, which featured an improved fuel pump, a stronger integral shaft disc, and more robust bearings. The intent of the upgrade was to increase the flight capacity of the engines while increasing reliability and safety. About one mile from the launch pad. Three engines on board Atlantis have throttled back to two-thirds throttle to prepare the spacecraft to pass through the area of maximum air pressure and go supersonic. Atlantis, Houston, go at throttle up. Okay, go at throttle up. Three engines on board back at full throttle. Atlantis now traveling more than a thousand miles per hour. One minute, 10 seconds since launch, Atlantis has already consumed more than a million tons of propellant. Altitude now 12 miles. Speed 1,700 miles per hour. 10 miles downrange from the launch pad. Five seconds since launch, a flight controls will be standing by for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets that coming up uh, in just about 10 seconds. Solid rocket booster jettison. Altitude now 30 miles. Speed 3,070 miles per hour. Atlantis approached the station after a two-day rendezvous orbit on April 10th and docked to PMA-2 on Destiny. This is what it looked like as we approached from in front, and you can see this right here is a docking module on the uh, International Space Station, and that's the target that we're trying to, uh, to dock to. This is what it looked like from the flight deck as we're getting ready to dock. You can see the uh, International Space Station coming down and we're about three feet away, and this is what it looked like from one of our cameras. The uh, orbiter's down here, and this is as we're getting ready uh, to, uh, to dock to the station. When we get within about three inches, we actually fire quite a few jets on the orbiter to make sure that we have good contact. 
And uh, I was very relieved that uh, the docking had gone well. That meant that we could uh, carry on with the rest of the mission. And uh, at this point, uh, later that same day, we were able to open the hatches, and there you see both of the commanders, Yuri Franco of the expedition crew and Mike Bloomfield of our crew. And uh, we were the first faces these guys had seen in four months, so we got quite a welcome when we all uh, entered into the U.S. laboratory. We got right to work. One of our jobs was transferring equipment. You can see I'm not only holding a bag, but I have another bag between my knees, which makes transferring in space a little bit more efficient than uh, here on Earth. Installation of the S0 truss was the primary objective and began with the removal of the truss from Atlantis's payload bay. Mission specialist Ellen Ochoa lifted it out with the station's robotic arm and maneuvered it onto a clamp at the top of the destiny module. And here we are in the, at the robotic workstation as we're doing that maneuver. Uh, you can see the five monitors there that are showing us five different camera views. The truss contains navigational devices, computers, cooling and power systems that are all needed to attach additional laboratories to the complex. Four spacewalks were required for the task of installation. The truss serves as a platform on which the other trusses are attached and additional solar arrays are mounted to form the 356 foot long space station. Sometimes the camera view can be a little bit distracting. You're trying to monitor the arm in S0, but there's a beautiful view of the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba and the Suez Canal and the Nile Delta behind it. And here we are moving uh, S0 into the position where we're going to start the final install onto the zenith side of the laboratory. Over here on the right is the claw. It's the claw goes around the capture bar and provide the mechanical attachment. And this is the camera view we were using for the final alignment. We're trying to get these alignment bars right down the center of these V-guides right here. Dan Birch was actually at the controls for that final install and did a great job. You can also see here at the robotics workstation a number of laptops, including one that shows us a bird's eye view of the station uh, provided by the Doug program. After the temporary latching on April 11, 2002, Mission Specialist Rex Walheim and Mission Specialist Steve Smith began the first of four spacewalks to electrically and structurally mate the truss to the station. The spacewalking pair attached two of the four mounting struts onto Destiny, deployed trays of avionics equipment and cables connecting Destiny to the truss, and attached an umbilical system from the truss to the mobile transporter, and finally secured critical power connections. On April 13, 2002, Mission Specialist Jerry Ross and Mission Specialist Lee Morin bolted the final two struts of the S0 truss to the Destiny lab. Morin used Canada Arm 2 to work while Ross was tethered to the station. The two removed support panels and clamps from the truss and then installed a backup device with an umbilical reel from the mobile transporter rail car. A restraining bolt that needed to be removed did not perform as expected and was left for a later spacewalk. The next day on April 14, 2002, Mission Specialist Smith and Mission Specialist Walheim released the claw that initially held the truss to the lab. They also reconfigured Canada Arm 2 connectors for electricity from the lab to be powered by the truss. Smith and Walheim also released clamps that secured the mobile transporter to the truss. A task to attach the airlock spur, a 14-foot ladder, from the truss to the Quest airlock was delayed into the fourth EVA. The fourth EVA happened on April 16, 2002, for 6 hours and 37 minutes, and was performed by Mission Specialist Ross and Mission Specialist Morin, who installed the 14-foot beam, the airlock spur, from the S0 truss to the Quest airlock. The beam provides a quick pathway for future spacewalkers working on truss assembly. Ross tested switches on both sides of the truss for future truss assembly. He and Morin installed floodlights on Unity, connecting that module and Destiny, to provide illumination for future spacewalks. Other activities included attaching a work platform on the station for future construction work, 
installing electrical converters and circuit breakers, and attaching shock absorbers to the mobile transporter rail car. Between and during spacewalks, shuttle and ISS crew members transferred experiments and supplies between the shuttle and the station. They also transferred oxygen from the shuttle to one of four high-pressure gas tanks used on the Quest airlock to repressurize the module after spacewalks. Overall, 100 pounds of oxygen and 50 pounds of nitrogen were transferred. Initial tests of the movement of the mobile transporter were successful. ISS flight engineer Waltz commanded the transporter via laptop computer to move to worksite 17 feet down a rail spanning the 44 foot length of the girder. Then he moved it back to a second site and then back to the first. Automatic latching, which did not occur due to minute lifting of the rail car, was eventually accomplished by manual commands. Other transporter systems functioned perfectly. On April 17, 2002, Atlantis undocked from the station and performed the standard fly-around maneuver, eventually separating from the station after taking many pictures. And then here we have the view from uh, inside the uh, orbiter. This is really amazing because that uh, part of the station that's moving away is only about three feet or so from our face looking out the window, so it really is an amazing sight to watch it slip away so close to you. We moved out in darkness uh, and then got up to 450 feet and watched the sun come up. This is real-time view of the sun coming up on the station. Uh, we're looking from the orbiter and the sun's behind us and as soon as the sun came up we started to fly around. Once the, once the sun does come up to where you can see it though, it's blindingly bright in space. So we're all wearing sunglasses but even with that it was kind of hard to look that way. This was a nice view the station got for us of the space shuttle with an empty payload bay now that S0 was up on the uh, space station. This is coming around the back side of the station. You can see S0 on the far side, and this is similar to the slide that we showed before the uh, presentation. Flight deck got kind of crowded there, but everybody's working. You can see Rex there with the handheld laser. Uh, Steve is on the right and Jerry's on the left. Both have different cameras, and uh, Mike just had to come up from the front to uh, take a look since he has no windows up there that he can see the station with. And I was somewhere on the floor in that view. This was our last real view of the space station, right not long before the sun went down. You can see the S0 there and the beautiful golden arrays. Uh, just before the sun went down and then we separated. Two days later, Atlantis made its deorbit burn and returned to runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center. The entry in many ways is uh, even more dramatic than the launch into space. Uh, you got to take all that energy that you put into the orbit and you got to take it all out and it comes out in the form of heat. And we made a big right uh, sweeping turn as we flew over KSC and uh, you'll see the coastline coming into view here in a minute. This is what it looked like out of uh, Steve's window as we uh, aligned the orbiter up with the runway. It was a pretty neat feeling to roll out where the uh, computers told you to do and you look down there and lo and behold the runway's there right where it's supposed to be. Um, we are coming down you can see at an angle of about uh, 20 degrees and we'll hold that angle of 20 degrees uh, descent angle until we get to about 2,000 feet and then at 2,000 feet we begin to pull the nose of the orbiter up to the horizon and then as we pass through uh, 300 feet, Steve pushes a couple of buttons on the uh, forward part of the orbiter and we get the gear coming down. It's always amazing to me and I think it's a tribute to the technology that we can start this whole process for landing uh, half a world away. Literally we start the burn someplace over Australia and then as it turned out uh, for this landing we were able to touch down within about 100 feet of uh, the desired touchdown point. I think it's a real tribute to the, all the hard work that went into the mission. And then finally we get the, uh, the drag chute out and that uh, slows us down and lessens the load on the nose gear as we uh, roll out at, uh, at Kennedy Space Center. And uh, we were quite happy to be home after 11 days in space and uh, traveling about 4.5 million miles.